Colin, how are you doing today? I'm good, Harry. How are you doing? Been a while since I've seen you. You were on your uh, European vacation, and I feel like I uh, barely know you. So uh, hopefully, we still like each other. I I think we'll be all right, but I'll I'll return to my <laughs> daily texting. Um, so. <laughs> Awesome. Well, luckily we have Caitlin here to bridge the gap and I'm really uh, excited to chat with you. So how are you doing today, Caitlin? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Well, Colin, you want to start with her bio? Yeah, I'd love to. Caitlin, great to have you. Uh, we got to meet you through uh, one of our former guests, uh, Jack Greco, uh, a, a crowd favorite for our sure. first guest. People. Yeah. Love Jack. Guest, Jack's uh... fantastic. He's so great. Can't speak higher of Jack. The people love Jack. The wannabes love Jack. And so anyway, but uh, any intro from Jack has always been good. And I, I get a few of them. So Caitlin, hugely successful career. It's been exciting to read about and learn. Uh, but currently you're the managing director of Avalanche BC, which is an early stage venture firm investing in massive technology driven trends, starting with how people learn, earn and own. And you were previously a very active angel investor and have been an LP in a number of companies and funds. But prior to that, you're also a founder of a company, Delivery Associates, which was a public sector advisory firm driving outcomes and technology and implementation worldwide. And you built that, it sounds like from the ground up all the way until an exit to private equity in the looks like last year. And then also co-founded another venture fund called Pearson Ventures, uh, focusing on head tech. So it's definitely been a theme through your career of doing venture and also in the space around education. So, and then I also get to welcome you warmly to the great town of Austin. So welcome, That's welcome right. here. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I'd like to, you know, we'd love to dive in and learn more about, you know, you in particular. And, you know, obviously we talk a lot about angel investing, but, you know, I think first off getting to know you, you know, how many investments have you made kind of on the angel investing front? I can't remember anymore, but probably like 20 or 25. I mean, I have a spreadsheet of all of them. Some of them are quite, are, are smaller than others, but you know, I've done, I guess if you like, I don't count, count like the we funder ones, but like from angel list to like direct, probably like 20. And then like average check size for you, it sounds like there was a range for you, but was there kind of a sweet spot that you kind of ended up on? I think like. 10k is kind of my sweet spot now, but I've inc increasingly like prefer higher conviction bets. So I've kind of like dialed down being broad and instead started to go deep. Interesting. That's a little bit different than what we've heard from a lot of different guests on their strategy. So I'm, I'm glad to have a, like a little bit more of a contrary position on this. And then lastly, cool. you know, we hit, we hit on the, uh, you know, what you kind of focus on now is this kind of what what was it the uh, earn earn learn that, own yeah earn learn own. yeah that, so tell so, us a little bit more what you so part on of that. what's dialed down my my angel investing is that i so i did 36 companies in fund one of avalanche and it was a small a smaller fund run on angel list and so i kind of i wouldn't say i took an angel investing approach to it because i because i definitely thought about it differently but it like doing that many deals in about two years meant that I, and making a significant like GP commit to that fund and then to my fund too, I've kind of been like, okay, like I'll just be much more targeted and professional about investing. And then when I do do angel stuff, it's like very targeted. Okay. So it sounds like you're doing sort of a, a mix of a, some angel stuff right now, but obviously your full-time focus is uh, Avalanche VC now. Mm -hmm. Got it. Well, so before we dive into sort of Avalanche and kind of what you're up to now, I'd love to know a bit about your journey. And uh, I, I like this starting question. So I'd love to know about your first angel check. Uh, what was it and uh, why'd you invest? What got you into it? Well, I track my investing career way back before ever like writing an angel check. And so when I was in college, I was the CEO of the Duke University Union, so the student union on campus. And I essentially like used our, it was, it was the largest student body by like dollars per year. So I think we had about a million and I kind of made essentially like an angel bet into a recording studio on campus called small town records and made that as like a new division of the student union. And it kind of comes back first full circle for me because the first investment that I made in avalanche. VC fund fund one, which was actually like my, my first big significant angel check was in a company called the social Institute. And one of the co-founders was the co-founder of that record label back at Duke. Small world. So, you know, I think, I feel, I think angel investing, like I, I track my roots down, like way beyond kind of like actually writing 
a more significant check. Yeah, very cool. And what a sort of inspired you to make the move from angel investing to going the venture firm route? Yeah, well, I actually started more on the venture firm route because I, you know, started my career at McKinsey in San Francisco, wanted mm -hmm. to kind of join the venture technology industry back in 2011. Didn't really see like the right fit then. It was just like such a different like time and place. The industry was so much smaller. The things they looked for in founders were different. It was way less accessible. And so I went and left McKinsey with a senior partner and joined Pearson first to help them design their global efficacy strategy and then to launch their corporate venture fund. So I actually started my angel, like I was a VC before I was invested my own money. That's not a route you see is going venture, angel, venture. That's kind of like a unique one. In terms of like what, you know, like you kind of going that route, starting venture, going to angel, and then going back to venture, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit what you kind of view as like the difference between angel investing and the investing through a venture fund, having gone through both of those. Yeah. Well, so I went from corporate venture to like founding my like co-founding a company. And then when the company was successful and like paying, you know, profits out to its shareholders, I started angel investing my own money. And then I always knew I wanted to get back into early stage venture in a more formal way and raise external capital. And the reason for that is I think in, in venture capital and startups, like fundamentally you are doing business building. And so I wanted to start my own firm after I had the credibility of going from PowerPoint to, to exit. And when I could like make a significant commitment from my own capital to the fund to show that I had skin in the game and that I was able to do it. And when I had a little bit more of a track record. And so I think it was a pretty like seamless transition and, and definitely part of the strategy that I always had for where, where I thought my skills would outperform and what I like to do with my time. Got it. That makes and sense. And part of, I think being a, being a okay. VC is like, you're able to like, you know, lead the terms of the rounds, think more strategically, bring people along with you, have access to follow on capital. Uh, like it's a full-time job for me now, which is very different from being an angel investor. And like as an angel, you're mostly following on terms. Like you're not actually going out negotiating anything, presumably. And that's, that's interesting from that perspective. And so from the leading standpoint, you know, does Avalanche, do you lead rounds? Do you follow on? Like, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So for, for fund one, you know, we were, we were pretty small check, so we didn't like formally lead, but I was often like, could be the first investor in or the first person committed where we've done the best. I was like really working with the founder on thinking through their idea, the business, the company, how they were, were pitching it and positioning it. And then for fund two, we focus primarily on pre-seeds and are willing to be the lead investor of that round. And we, we would do seeds, but I actually haven't done a seed yet. What are the uh, size checks you're doing at pre-seed and what type of companies are you looking at with Avalanche? 250K, 300K companies, you know, that have a clear view of how they transform, how people learn, earn, or own. We love founders who are building their life's work. Like they've kind of like been in the sector for a long time. They know what the like gaps are, can see the opportunities are, and are in a pro professional position where they're able to build something significant. And you know that they're not going to like give up and they won't, they'll have access to capital because they've already kind of built their reputation in the space. For those who might be thinking about, you know, kind of making the jump from angel into a more formal venture type, type of role, either a fund or, you know, maybe working at a venture fund, what, what do you usually recommend to having gone through it yourself? Because I will say one thing that was funny that I kind of empathize with when we asked you how many angel investments, you said, uh, 20, 20, oh, I don't know. I've got a spreadsheet somewhere, right? Like if one of your LPs asked about your fund, I'm sure you'd have a very dialed in answer right? But that's sort of, you know, kind of like the good and bad about angel and funds. I'm curious, what do you recommend to others or how do you advise people? I think it's, it's very different. And I think you have to have like eyes wide open for, for what you want and also what your role is in the ecosystem. And everyone kind of like brings a different piece to, to the table. Like, are you a former founder? Are you a technical? Are, are, do you have a very concrete marketing skill set? Like, do you have a, a special network that gives you edge? And so I think you really mm -hmm. have to just have an answer of like, what's so special about you that is going to make you potentially outperform or help the fund that you're Got doing it. outperform. And what is uh, so special about you, Caitlin, that uh, made you want to make the jump? <laughs> Yeah, you well, keep I think, me up for that you know, question, so I obviously had to ask. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I think there's, you know, everyone's kind of unique in their own way, but I, it's pretty unique to have like worked 
in a big, like a big strategy consulting firm, worked at a big corporate yeah. um, and have all those like industry relationships, have started a company, exited to private equity, which, you know, we never raised external capital for that. So it's not necessarily the, tr the traditional mm -hmm. venture model. And then I think that the second big bucket is that I'm pretty opinionated on where I think the future is going. We write a blog called Obviously the Future, the idea of um, behind avalanches that there are these invisible trends or like forces underneath the surface that not everybody sees. And if you can invest pre avalanche, you can realize outsized returns. So like, I look at a lot of my peers and I don't see a lot of like, here's where I think the puck is go I'm going. I mean, sometimes there mm -hmm. is, but mm -hmm. often it's kind of like, oh, we do like B2B software. Or, like I believe in the future of work or like AI is going to revolutionize things. And it's like, we try to be a little bit more specific with like an er industry vertical lens. So you try to have like a point of view that's more of like the future will look like X, Y, or Z thing versus saying, I'm finding a good investment of what's popped up today. Yeah. And usually that helps us because like the founders, we have like a shared vision of the world. Like we see it, that like we find people that like we think about it in the same way. And usually when, you know, you hear a pitch, it's a, it's like problem, solution, market size. And I find that like, I'm like, okay, I, I either like, if it's going well, I kind of get it already. I don't need to be like educated. If you have to be educated on all of those sort of basics, I think it's really hard to scale your investments because you're just like always like trying to learn so much and then you can be like very easily confused. Yeah, you're not you're not a domain expert in some sense, right? Like you don't have like a, a long history of data points and learnings to be able to make a more informed decision. I, th I think one uh, a good example is I, I think I sent you a deal and it was in, in the education space and you came back to me and said, one of the one of the things that I have like thought about a lot is that people don't necessarily pay for education, right? Like in the same sense, like bites, like consumers don't pay for education. They kind of expect it to be free. And I was like, my mind was blown because it's what I've experienced. Like, and I just helps me to think a lot about investing in deals in that type of space where I'm not an expert. Yeah. So. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it, like potentially partnering with you or Jack, you find people who are experts in marketplaces. Like I'm not an expert in a marketplace. So it's good. But like, then you, you kind of find the overlaps and build coalitions. Do you have any other interesting insights on the education tech side or any of what you're looking at? Like little nuggets like that, that hopefully can blow more minds out there. So, so we do more than ed tech. I like to say that mm -hmm. we do like learning technology and that, you know, as you have machine learning and artificial intelligence, human intelligence and human learning, they can keep pace. And so I think that there's also a lot of things in the enterprise that are very learning oriented, like the sales process or customer success and the best founders and best products build like essentially like learning products into their software. So like one example of this is like Figma has done a really good job of being like having an embedded education. Like it's a tool for designers to be able to do their jobs where they're like learning to be better designers by using the tool. Yeah. So Caitlin, one thing that sort of stood out to me in your bio was I saw the EBITDA term and also the fact that, you know, like you mentioned, you, you know, started this com or, you know, your co-founder and brought this company to an exit. And I think one thing that the reason why that stood out is because, you know, I think we see a lot of founders like to be a successful founder these days, it's like, oh, they're a second time founder. They raised a hundred million bucks in their first company. Like that sometimes is the definition of success. Just raising money. doesn't matter if the company imploded, up, didn't do well. They had one you know, nice round of uh, fundraising, but seems like the tides are shifting a bit and like actually bringing a company more towards maturity and exit is much more important these days. So would love to kind of get your take on that. Yeah, I think, I think the venture market is really changing. It's certainly not like homo, it's not homogeneous and people like mm -hmm. paint it with these broad brush strokes and you're like, okay, there's, there's like growth equity is a totally, whatever SoftBank is doing is totally different from like my micro fund and like those should not be in the, in the same category of investors and like accelerators and incubators are totally different as well. And so I think part of it is like, I think we're just at the beginning of the sort of reckoning of, you know, in interest rates at being at 5% and people beginning to think, okay, well maybe <laughs> we need to turn some of that TVPI into DPI and what does that actually mean? And if you want to like get DPI, that's not just also secondaries to other like firms farther down the line, like at some point there isn't going to be a, like a greater source of capital that, that, that will believe in the value of, of, of those assets. So you actually have to get to some fundamentals on like EBITDA 
multiples, which is what most of the private equity, like what, um, like a much larger portion of asset allocation actually measures performance on. Got it. And for those uh, who don't know, not me, but, uh, you know, for those who don't know, TVPI and TPI, what does that mean? So a total value to, <laughs> to pay it in, because you probably do this on like every call, right? Or is it just so jargony? <laughs> No, we, 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 ask, I mean, we always ask for clarification on any acronym. Yeah. So b basically TVPI is, is a measure of like, you know, the value of a company or your portfolio based usually on like the last priced round and then DPI is distributed value to pay in. And that's actually like cash that you've given back to your investors and, you know, cash is, is king at the end of the day. So, you know, I, I think yeah. that like I optimize for cash on cash returns. And then this market, I guess, DPI is sort of saying like, hey, you actually made money, right? Like T TVPI is more paper gains. And, you know, when, when times are good, you know, people kind of look to that and then DPI and, um, you know, maybe more of a, a tougher market. It's like, that's when the, the chicken comes home to roost. Does that sound about right? Yeah. I mean, it's not perfect because this industry, like, I mean, my fund vehicles are 10 year time horizons, right? Yeah. And so you're not saying that you'll get DPI in two years or three years, especially if you're doing pre-seed and seed investing, you have to have patience and you have to be able to like work with companies through the ups and downs to protect the value in them. And so I think it's like, it's much, tr it's like trickier and more nuanced than, you know, meets the eye when you're actually a manager, but that's like, it's, it's an easy like way to put it is like, especially if you've been an, a, a venture investor for 10 years, like you're really looking to get DPI at this point. Yeah. You're One really thing I also wanted to ask you about, Caitlin, I mean, in this kind of market, can you talk a little bit about right now for founders, you know, building, like, what does it take to, especially since you're doing pre-seed, like, what does it take to kind of have a business, have a startup that could potentially be venture backable versus, you know, just something that's either non-venture finance, maybe more of a lifestyle business. Maybe it's something that, you know, you just try and kind of do yourself and make money with. How do you think about the two? And like, what do you tell or advise founders in that situation? Yeah, I think that a lot of it is about, well, well, first, like if you are going to be building a venture backed company, then you're, you have to be building a technology company. And that means that you have to have someone on your team, on the co-founding team that is a technologist. So like we often pass on companies that don't have technology at their core. And so, so one of the things we say, especially like a good, like ed tech saying is like, I, we don't invest in schools, staffing or services. And like, I think you can make good money potentially on like services is where, like, I was like, I think you can, you can, if, if you need services to like get you going or get started, like I come from a consulting background, I think you can productize a lot of, um, the, like consulting skill set. So I have a lot of time. I have more time for that. As long as people know that they are, they need to productize it, but they have to be able to find like an inflection point and be able to get to a place where they have, you know, 30, 40% margins and you know, are not relying on huge amounts of like people or real estate or hardware. The, uh, so, so I want to circle back to like what you said initially at the beginning about you're going into more concentrated bets and higher conviction. And I feel like that goes a little bit counter to most of the advice I would say, or most of the experience that we get from a lot of folks that come on. And so I'd, I'd like to hear more about that from your, like, what was your either data or logic or thought progression into that? I'd like to learn more from that. Yeah. So one of my mentors, or it's not really a mentor, but like it's someone who's given me a lot of like a Midas list, top Midas list investors that gives me a lot of advice was like, you know, I kind of came in and it, you know, you go, you go through some of these like accelerators for VCs and they're like, you have to do portfolio construction like this. And you need to have at least like 20 to 30 bets in order to like hit the power law. And he's like, what is this like garbage? Like anyone who's made anything like has made their mark in the venture career has put significant amount of money into a big winner and like been able to like make their mark on that. And they're like, if you're just like getting little pieces of allocation or, you know, or even like more sig like significant ownership ship stakes in a broad basket and like hoping that you like hit the power law, that's, that's kind of like table stakes. Like it's not what's going to like make you stand out as a v VC and like really have a career in this industry. 
It's like, there's tons of people who can do that. And so I also think that like my most valuable resource is time. And so like, where do I, you know, spend my time and like, wh who do I, you know, you can only take like so many calls at 9 PM on Friday. And I think by like ha having a high bar, you actually are going to save yourself a lot of the things that you're like, Hey, I think I really, I want to do this, but I'm not sure about this, this, and this. And you're like, okay, well actually that's just a no. But I think if you were purely like, Oh, I want to collect assets and charge 220 and like having more likely outcome, like the highest expected value might be, or like the most risk adjusted highest expected value of like your output as a GP is probably that. But it's like, if you want to like shoot for the moon, which is like, this is an industry where you are supposed to do that, then you should be more concentrated and have more conviction in the best that you're making. Yeah, I, I think kind of what you're hitting on is that like, you want to be known as a great investor, right? Like you have to have conviction and things, right? And concentration to have really outsized returns. I think that's clear. It, it is interesting that maybe on the average person, like, you know, you're, you're very thoughtful about the future, right? Like you're thinking in terms of, where the puck is going and making bets, concentrated bets in the future. Whereas most people probably are interested in doing this are probably better off in an indexing strategy, right? In that the sense that they probably don't have the time and energy or expertise to think about the future and maybe the way that a concentrated bet would make sense. I'm just trying to draw some yeah. parallels for people to like how to how to think through this, because I think two things can be true, right? Like that like in the venture world, very successful people will have made really concentrated, like high conviction bets and have very, very outsized returns. Right. And like, that's like a, the, the, the rubric for success, right. Versus if you're like more strategically angel investing, like even you said, you made a lot of angel investments, right. You spread out and therefore, you know, reduce the volatility of the portfolio, probably the increased likelihood of at least returning your capital. I think that's, I don't know, at least one way to think about it. Yeah. All right. I mean, who knows? I could be wrong. Like I like, I hey. kind of like wake up in terror one day a week and I'm like, oh, what if I'm like vastly wrong? But I, I think that's like, I don't know, a more courageous way to like live or, and I've chosen that path for myself, but I, it's definitely not like a low stress strategy. Definitely. Cool. Well, we appreciate you sharing your journey and all of your insight. And for our, our final section, I see you're on Twitter. I don't know how active you are, Caitlin. I see a tweet pop up from you once in a while, but uh, we've got trending Twitter threads. I'll share uh, the first one here on the screen. It's from Darren Marble, looks like his name is, and I'll read it off. Founders insist that your advisors invest, even if it's just $5,000. Think about it. An advisor passes your deal to a colleague. Colleague says, did you invest? Advisor says, no but you should thinking emoji. So would love to get your thoughts. Agree, disagree, or what do you think, Caitlin? I agree. Like yeah. your advisor I, I should, like should invest yeah, the only or like, like what's the point? Bones. Like, I always just think like, there's such like, whenever I see a deck and there's like a list of like all these advisors and they're not like, there's no skin in the game and they're not like working really working actively on the idea. It's kind of like a demerit against the company. Hmm. Yeah. The only sort of small bone I would pick is like $5,000 is a lot. Like I know, especially when I was getting started and, you know, coming on as an advisor for a lot of different companies, I had a lot of conviction for them, but, you know, I probably wouldn't have been able to afford 5,000. So I think if it's, you know, kind of commensurate with your net worth at the time, and there was a way to easily, you know, kind of do like a roll up vehicle that the founder had and you could invest 1K or 2.5K, I think the, the signal is the same, but I do think like putting a little money in there is important. I think. Yeah. But I would also like, I mean, you just said I was advising a bunch of companies and I'd be like, okay, like yeah. the advisor matters. Like the, like I'm, I would be a, I'm a quality over quantity person. If it's, I'm like, okay, well that mm -hmm. person that advises like a bunch of companies. I'm like, I'd much rather have the, like, no, they've really like doubled down and believe in like this founder yeah, or point. this idea. I have a couple of takes here. One, I think you're putting the, make them quick cons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, great, or investors have a conviction lens, right? Like, that's how they they're trying to get more data points about their conviction, and so therefore they look at other people as like validation of conviction, right? Whereas I look at someone like Harry, who has expertise in ride sharing and can actually derive value for a company that they would pay for if they had cash, mm. right? Like, they would say like, hey, like he has marketing services, and so I think there's two very different ways to think about this. 
where if you actually have value add services, but a company can't pay you for it right now, you investing in them to deliver them value in the equity side, you know, like I, I don't feel like that's is actually like necessarily has to be that way. And so I do think people get paid all the time in equity as advisors, right? That's just what we call it. Um, and it doesn't mean they have conviction. I think they actually have conviction because they put their time in. Like that's like, well, th I think doing a service contract is different than being an advisor. So like, I've definitely had founders that were like, like I have one, one founder that got his like rent reduced by like $10,000 and it's like, they basically <laughs> the person like invested in the safe instead. And I was like, okay, like uh -huh. they were going to burn that money. And instead of, you know, like, I think that's great. I think that's amazing. Like if you can get your customers or like advisors who are doing real work for you that you would pay them for to instead like take that payment in, in equity, a hundred percent. That's yeah, very, this clever. is like I've a whole nother can of worms. Yeah, yeah. This is like a whole nother can of worms. Caitlin, we'll, we'll uh, have to do a future episode all on this <laughs> about the blurred lines between investor, advisor, providing services, what you will and won't do, but uh, appreciate your take. And so the final one, uh, the finding and final trending Twitter thread that we have for you is from Rod Mallow, uh, recovering entrepreneur and sneakerhead partner at Outsized VC. Uh, he says, I'm a tiny LP in six venture funds. I'm leading around. So I sent four of them this investment opportunity. Three out of four replied with who else is investing? What do you think about this besides the fact that I'm not signal? So, you know, we talked a lot about conviction. Caitlin, you're up. What do you think? Well, we haven't seen the email that he sent, you know, like I think being sent a deal mm. when it's a done deal and they're like, hey, there's only like 300K left. You have 24 hours to decide is very different than, Hey, I found this like amazing founder and opportunity. Do you want to look at it with me? Like, let's diligence it together. Maybe this is something you could lead. So I, I, I like, I kind of, I don't want to judge without more information because if he's, I'm leading around, I'm leading around and they ask who else is investing. That's kind of, I, that's also just kind of weird, right? Like, yeah, it's kind of a weird question to ask. Cause it's like, I'm investing. I, I, I think I like the sort of joke that Rod made. Maybe it's not a joke, but he said, besides the fact that I'm not a good signal, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I'm the one leading, right? That's the signal. Yeah. Like if one of my LPs sent me a deal, I wouldn't, I, I feel like I wouldn't ask like who else is investing because I, the most important signal would be be the LP, um, but I don't know. Yeah, a couple of the responses Hadley says, sounds like you should not invest in their next funds. <laughs> Alex Cohen said you should write all the funds down to zero. And then our uh, buddy Turner Novick uh, sounds like they're asking the hard questions. So right uh, in line with what uh, <laughs> Turner, Turner's cheekiness on Twitter. So Colin, any quick thoughts? No, I think, I mean, this is pretty common though, right? It's like people just look for evidence of like, other points that make them comfortable investing. Like, I think that's like just very common behavior is like, wh what was gonna get me in like comfortable to even look at this or even think that this is like worth investing in. It's, and I guess you can view it as lazy, but I also view it as like a way to weed through all of the things that come in. Like, I think we can all agree the amount of emails that we get with deals is just like insane. And like, yeah, yeah. I'd love to respond yes or no to every one of them. But at the same time, you are going to look for high signal things, right? And if you have like other firms leading, like, I mean, regardless of who invests, if you have a lead investor, I'm like, okay, well, this clearly someone has done some, hopefully, uh, it's not FTX, has done some <laughs> diligence and you're like, okay, like someone else has put time, energy into this, meaning there's potential meaningful opportunity here. I should probably, I, I, higher likelihood of me looking at that. In some cases, sometimes ones, I have the opposite yeah. view. Maybe, true. maybe this is where you're going, where you're like, I'm like, why am I following this investor? Yeah. With like deeper I mean, pockets. I think, right. I, I mean, it totally t depends on the round dynamic, but if they're like, oh, I've already raised like a couple million dollars from like so-and-so and, and you're like, and they're not like doing your bridge, you know? Hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. No, that, well, Caitlin, I mean, at pre-seed, if you're doing pretty good size checks, you know, 250,000, you know, I mean, a lot of pre-seeds might be 500,000, so, or a few hundred thousand. Do you even care who else is investing? Or it's like, you know, we're putting in 250, like that's a, you know, sizable amount. Like, does it matter who else is in there with you? 
I mean, I think the, the like scariest thing for me is actually more like losing a deal to somebody else mm -hmm. Be because yeah. like you're, if, if you're doing it right, you're like, okay, I've, I found one and I think other people are going to see the value in this pretty quickly. And like, I need to, to move, especially at like the terms and the valuation that I want before other people see it. So, yeah, I mean, although like there, there's others that like I, I did one where like there, I don't think anyone else was going to invest in this company and it's, and it's been a hard road, but like, if you, if you talk to experienced VCs, they're like my, I could have a never predicted the, the companies that would have turned out amazing B the hot rounds were not like my big winners. And so you have to like find some, like, I, I like to play both of those be like, all right, can I win by being quicker and faster? And then also can I win by being like contrarian and working harder on something that looks that where a founder looks rough around the, the edges because they don't know how to play the game but that actually means they're like so deep in the domain and have like an edge in the market that other founders that are just like throwing spaghetti against the wall don't have i think yeah. there is a nicole uh, wishkoff had a tweet that was kind of you know i mean she's doing her solo gp kind of um, piece too is like she's either you're competing with people or you're you're fr being friendly with people Right, like with the like the other funds, and I I thought that was really interesting. I kind of hearing that from you too. It's like at some point you're just going head to head and you're competing for great deals, right? Because you're going to fill a large chunk of that round, and that's all that's actually needed to get to the rest of the round to to fill in some sense. Is that kind of like your experience in this? I've never felt like competitive, competitive. Like oh, it's either me or this person because I try to like get their fat, get to conviction faster to avoid competition, you know? And then I also feel, I think like I've been strategic to keep the, the check size small enough. And it's an environment where like you could convince a founder to like take more, like be like, Hey, there's strategic reasons why you should like take, take my money. But yeah, I think, I think you have to like yeah. get to, con you have to like get to a decision pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, I like that, getting to conviction quickly. So uh, definitely good advice. And Caitlin, we really appreciate you coming on. If folks want to follow you, learn from you, or maybe pitch you, what is the best way to uh, get a hold of you? Well, I'm just Caitlin at avalanche.vc. I, I am active. I was like, I had a big Twitter day where I was, or like month where I was like posting every day, but I will get back on Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter or connect with me on LinkedIn. Those all work. Awesome. Cool. Well, we appreciate you coming on, Caitlin, and uh, best of luck in the future. Take care. Thanks.